Okay. We are go. Let's begin. Do we have homework today? Chapter two? No. Chapter three? No. Didn't sure. Homework. So we're gonna continue with chapter three. Just want to make sure. Questions for questions for what? I thought we didn't have homework. You gave we gave we did chapter two homework already, right? No. We didn't? No. We did chapter one homework. Well, why did we do chapter two homework? We finished chapter two a while ago. No, we Because the Excel thing really had me confused. Because I wasn't sure if that was due today or not. Because some people were like, we're going to go over it today. It was oh, like, when you guys say homework 2, you're talking about Excel homework? Yeah. No. No, no. no we're Chapter talking about number 3. No. Wait, is the whole chapter 2 due today? Or like, are we going? Okay. I'm talking about the one with the money problems. The word uh, problems. What? That wasn't due today? No, no. that's number 4. Yeah. Four. No. And the homework number 4, that's whatever cool. follows number 3. Yeah, let's do next week. Three yet. But number because two we, we started today. chapter three, I thought we were. So, like, if you look at this, um, the homework thing real quick, you yeah. see how it says 2.5 and 2.5, there's like two homeworks for chapter two? Yeah. Whenever we finish the chapter, are they both you, or is it like we're just giving No, homework three is all of that. But since we also did exponential growth, would that also be true? Or is that next week? Or yeah. is that next week? That would be at the same time, because I finished all of those. We, we actually started the topics in in five. We're actually on topic five now. Spot? Yeah. Is that 2.5? That's what you're talking about. No, topic five says 3.1 to 3.3. 3. Oh, okay. So let's say we didn't do... Um, We're currently in chapter three. three. Like this homework. Yeah. Would so these both count as one homework that you No, they, the, the number of homework is always in the left. So okay. homework three is this, homework four is that, homework okay. five is that. But we're up to we're up to topic five. So no one did chapter two homework. So y'all get zero. <laughs> that would be funny. Anyway, we're gonna continue chapter two. Bring it next week. Okay. And then the, wait, just to clarify, do you want the Excel homework with that also on Monday? Yes. Okay. So the Excel when you you try you print out what you have. So I might have emailed you some Excel homework you might receive, which is incomplete. Just ignore that. Yes, I, I do. Okay, um, but yeah, last time we were doing approximation. We were approximating like the cube root of 7.9, and that's, that's in chapter 3. We're in chapter 3 now. So chapter 2 is done. So every time we finish chapter, we'll have a quiz? No. Like every week we have a quiz. Like we'll have a quiz no matter what. <laughs> I'm just saying when homework is due, it's after I finish the section. Okay. So I finished talking about money and exponential functions. Long time ago. We're actually in chapter Last three. Last question. Do you know how you drop the quizzes? The yep. two lows? Is there also like a curve? No. Like that's the curve, like drop your low grades. Yeah. For that question about how many years you can survive on your money, was yeah. it about thirty years? Was that way off? Who me or, or my accomplice? Oh, oh forever. Oh you could? Uh -huh. You could live forever on that money? I never run out of money. So oh, that was right. a trick question? Why would you do that? So if I left it blank, does that I had 99.8. No. No. Oh, like the, the, the bank account is growing faster than I'm withdrawing the money. Thought, it I would never run out. Can I like show you? <laughs> My bank I was like, this can't be right. That's what I meant. I voted until the cops catch you. So, so, until the cops um, catch you. So is that correct? No, it's not. <laughs> I'm Javon, I'll never get caught. I'm too smart for that. I'm always one step ahead of them. Hey. It doesn't matter who it is, I'll, I'll always escape the cops. Money is the only one. Is it too late? Javon, is it too late? If I get caught, I'll know it's one of you snitched on me. I'll, I'll, I'll find you. So don't even think about it. We're moving on to the main event. Last time we used linear approximation, last time we used the linear approximation formula. This is theorem 3.1 in your textbook. It's basically that guy that says f of x plus delta x. 
it's approximately equal to f of x plus f prime of x delta x. Right? That's in chapter 3, right? Which is on the quiz, right? Question 2 on the quiz is from chapter 3, because we did chapter, we started chapter 3. Times delta x, right? And we use that to approximate some values of certain roots. We approximated the radical of 25.1, the radical of 25.0, the cube root of 7.9. Okay, so now, yeah. For the quiz, if you wrote f of x equals f of a plus f of a prime times x minus a, would that work? Did anybody get Um, what did you write over here? f of x equals f of a, f prime of a, x minus a? That's the same thing. Yeah. Um, Okay, so um, the idea was, why didn't we even start this chapter? Well, as we said, differential equations, super important. A lot of natural phenomena can be described by differential equations. Population, certain kinds of money growth, all that stuff, right? So differential equations are important to solve. In chapter two, we learned a really nice technique to solve them, separation of variables, right? Sometimes you can write a differential equation in a certain form where we just integrate both sides, and everything's hunky to In general, though, this does not work. Life is not that nice. Sometimes you have differential equations, we don't even know how to solve. It's impossible to get to an answer, right? So our, the next best thing is to approximate our answer. And I, we showed you last time that we could approximate things and get pretty close to an answer, to the actual answer. So that's not an issue. We can get as close to the actual answer as we want to something without actually hitting the right answer. But, um, so that's the idea. We want to actually apply our powers of approximating two differential equations. What if we get a differential equation that separation of variables doesn't work or no other technique works, right? How do we get information about this function, right? So remember we were looking at things like, um, let's go back to this example. You don't have to write this down because I already had the discussion with this before, right? So we had that y prime equals y, and we went through separation of variables, and we end up with the solution to this is c to the x, right? And then we're saying if we are given an initial condition, we can actually find our c, right? So this guy is called our general solution. And then given some condition, I can plug in here, solve for my unknowns, and I can get the particular solution that solves my problem, right? This is a very nice differential equation because it happens to be separable. Um, you can solve some differential equations even when they're not separable. We don't learn that in this class, but if you take a class like 391, you'll cover all sorts of situations of different differential equations you can solve. However, there's still the case. There are many kinds that we cannot solve. We just don't know how to solve them. They don't have a nice method. So the answer is, the, the question is, if I know information about the rate at which something is changing, and I want to tell you about, I want someone to tell me about the value of the function, like what is the function itself doing, I might not be able to get to this, right? However, a lot of times in real life, I don't really care about this, right? I just care about an answer at a certain point, right? I know this is what's happening now. This is how fast things are changing. This is its current value. What is its value 10 years from now, 15 years from now? I don't care about what the function is doing in between. I just need, at this point in the future, what's happening, right? That's what I care about. A lot of times we don't care about the general function. We care about what its value is at some point, right? Which is what chapter three is about. We are going to learn how to find what the solution is doing at a certain point without knowing what the solution actually is, okay? That's the goal, right? And we can actually get as close to that value as we want, and I'll explain how, but that's basically the idea. Sometimes getting to the particular solution, impossible. But we still need the information. We still need to know what's going on. And so we use approximation. There are many ways to use approximations, right? So sometimes it's difficult slash impossible to obtain a particular solution. Instead, we can approximate this solution 
at certain points. There are many methods to do this. We'll do two of them. Right? So there are two methods of approximation that we're going to look at in this chapter. We're going to cover what's called Euler's method. Is one approximation method we use. And the other one is just this guy on steroids, which we call modified Euler's method. So in chapter three, it ends with these two techniques, which are going, it's going to help us allow, allow us to approximate answers to our differential equation when we don't know what the answer actually is. Um, yeah. So Euler, a very important mathematician, one of the few mathematicians who was very productive and prolific right up to his old age, which is it's actually quite rare. Math is a young man's game. Most of the math he studied was developed by kids 18, 19, 20, 21. Right. Mathematicians, if you don't make a contribution before you're 30, you'll probably never make one, statistically oh. speaking. But this guy, right up until he was an old guy, was still contributing to math. There are so many things he studied in math right now that's to do with this guy. It's not even funny. This symbol, E, why is it E? Because of that guy. It's named after Euler. That E is for the E in his name. He's the guy who came up with this guy. Right? So that's, he's a big deal, right? I see students pronounce this Euler all the time. We're going to use Euler's method. Wrong pronunciation. Euler. It's pronounced Euler. He's a Swiss mathematician. Very important guy. Anyway, we're going to use a method developed by him to approximate differential equations. Euler's method is going to use this equation in it. It's going to use theorem 3.1. Modified Euler's method, we use another equation, which is theorem 3.2, which I'll tell you about that when we get to modify. Um, but for now, we're going to cover Euler's method to approximate solutions to an ODE. That's where we are. Euler's method. Okay, so here's how it goes. Suppose we know suppose we're given. We're given an ODE. So here's a, an ordinary differential equation, dy dx is equal to some function, which may be complicated, may be separable or not separable, we don't know, some function with x's and y's all mixed together, right? And we know that we know some initial condition, y of a equals c. And we want to approximate y of b. Okay? So I have a differential equation. I have an initial condition. So I have a differential equation, and I know what's happening right now at some point. I want to t t find out what's going on at some future point. I know what's happening at point A. I want to know what's going on at point B. Point B can be far away, closer away, or very close by, doesn't matter. That's, that's the goal. That's what we want to do. We might not be able to even figure out what Y is, the solution to this guy, but I just I don't care what Y is. I want Y evaluated at a certain point. That's the goal. Right? How do you actually do this? Take the interval A, B. Cut it into n. It's called subintervals. Each of length delta x. So basically, what happens is I'm on this interval, right? A is here. B is over here. I know what y of a is, and I want to figure out what is y of b. So I want to somehow get from a to b. The first step is to cut this up, cut this interval up into several guys. I'm going to cut it up into n subintervals. Right? 
Now the length of each interval, each of these guys, I'm gonna call it delta x. I'm moving some change in x, and I keep inching by by delta x until I get to b. Right? Is it like Raymond's sum? Same idea like Raymond's sum. So I'm figuring out, I'm cutting this up into an equal number of pieces. Each length is delta x. This means, what is delta x? What is the length of delta x? Same idea as Riemann's sum, yes, pretty much exactly. No? I have this length, cut it up into n equals pieces, what is the length of one piece? B minus a over n. It's just whatever this size is, divided by the number of pieces I'm cutting it into. The length of an interval is just right minus left. So I get b minus a divided by n, right? This is an important equation. This will always be true. Final point minus initial point divided by how many subintervals you want to cut it into. Now in practice, you would choose what delta x you want, but in 209, we're usually <coughs> gonna tell you. I'm gonna say use this many subintervals. I'll, I'll tell you how many I want you to use. But in general, to get a better approximation, the smaller this guy is, the better the approximation is. So you can choose, oh, I want 1,000 or I want 5,000, right? But in, in math class, I'm going to say, like, use four. You know? With Excel, you can do thousands, right, and get a really nice approximation. Okay. So far, so good. That's the first step. So essentially the idea is this. I'm gonna start at A where I know the value of the function. I'm going to move over here, right? I'm gonna approximate Y value at that point using that equation. Now I start off there again with that as my initial condition and move over again. Approximate the Y value here again using the same equation. And I'm gonna keep doing that. Every step of the way I keep approximating what is the Y value, what is the Y value. I'm gonna keep going until I end up here. That's basically the idea. So every time I'm into, every time I inch forward, I'm using theorem 3.1. You know, what's the y value the next step? What is it at the next step? What is it at the next step? And I keep going until I end up here. Okay. So that's what we are going to do. Um, we'll set it up in a table. There are many ways to write it down. I, I, the table method is the easiest method, I think. Up in a table. Now I'm going to explain how this table works. In Euler's method, your table has three columns. There's an x, your input value. There's the y, your output value. We want to approximate one of these guys. And then there's going to be the y prime equals the function dy dx. It's going to be whatever formula I give you. Those are the three functions. Okay. Now remember the goal. I know y of a equals c, and I want to find y of b. Which means, on the first line, I kind of know what I already have, right? I know my x value is a. When my x value is a, my y value is c. c. And when my x is a and my y is c, what is my slope? Well, I'll be given a form formula. I'm just going to plug these guys in, right? This is going to be f of a comma c, right? So basically what I'm going to always do in this column, this works for everywhere in this column. Always plug in the x and y to the left into the given ODE, right? So once I have my x and y, just plug into the formula that I have, and I compute the slope, right? Because the differential equation is going to give me a formula for the slope, right? So if my x is a, my y is c, plug in a and c into this formula, right? So far, so good. That's at the first point. So at this point, I know the value of the function, and I know the value of the derivative. Okay, now let's move forward. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the x and we're gonna keep adding delta x to move to new x's, right? So here, I'm going to take my old x plus delta x. That will be the next position. 
and I will keep doing that. I'll keep adding my delta x until eventually I end up at b, right? So I start with an x, and I keep taking the old guy, keep adding delta x, keep adding delta x, keep adding delta x, until boom, I get to the x value I want. Yeah. What does it say next to delta x? X old. Oh. Yeah, oh. For old x. Yeah. Whatever the previous x value was, add delta x to it, and I keep doing that. So then we could write like a plus delta x? Yeah, this would be a plus delta x, a plus 2 delta x, a plus 3 delta x, all the way down until I get here, right? Here's where theorem 3.1 comes in. I know this y value, but I don't know that y value. I have to approximate it. So after the first step, you use theorem 3.1. And you, you continue to use this until you get all the way down here, right? So basically, theorem 3.1 <coughs> is going to say that this is the old y plus the old y prime times delta x, right? f of x times f of x prime times delta x, right? And I will be repeating that same formula until I get down here. And this is going to be my approximation to the y value of p. Now at any given time, I'm going to keep plugging in this x and this y into this formula that I'll be using later on, right? So in each row, I'm using the answers from the previous row, right? I'm using the old values, okay? So that's sort of the strategy here. In my x column, start at the beginning, the, the initial value of x, keep adding delta x until you get to b. You stop, right? The y, the initial comes here. You plug in x and y into the form for the derivative, that goes here. In the next line, you use theorem 3.1. You're going to take the old y value, which is this, plus the old y prime value, which is that, multiplied by the delta x. You're going to get another number go here. This number and that number goes into the formula. You get a new one here. Then you go to the next line, repeat the same process. It sounds complicated, but it's a lot easier in practice than to explain the theory. If you get it, it's usually nice. Students usually don't mess this problem up. The modified is a bit worse, but like regular all those methods, students usually do really pretty well on this. So let's actually do an example. I'm gonna start off super easy, then give you one a little harder. One where we kind of know what the answer is in the beginning anyway. Let's say dy dx is equal to y. <coughs> y of 0 is equal to 1. Approximate y at 1. Right? That's my first question. So I gave you a differential equation. y prime equals y. I give you an initial condition. And I want you to approximate here. So I told you what y of 0 is. I want you to tell me what y of 1 is. Yeah. That's the goal. So I'm not sure how much space I would need for that. Let's start over here, just to be safe. So you're going to go over here. You're going to set up three columns. x column is always the shortest one. So this is x, right? What's my first x value? 0. 0. That's my a, right? Here my a is 0. My b is 1. Which means, I already also know my delta x, right? What is that? Oh, I didn't tell you how many subintervals. No. I'll have to tell you how many subintervals, or it's, it's, it's not a complete question. Use four subintervals. The delta x is going to four. OK, so a is 0, b is 1. Delta x would be b minus a over n, so it's 1 fourth. Or I can do this as 0.25. Right? Can use decimals. We're going to be plugging into our calculator. Right? So what goes here is the first x value? Zero. What will be the next x value? One fourth, 0.25. Take this one, it's going to be zero plus 0.25, which gives me 0.25. Right? What will be the next value? 0.5. You take 0.25 plus 0.25, and you get 0.5. Right? 
this is the next value. Then you're going to take 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25. 0 0.75 is the next value. Then you're going to take 0 0.75 plus 0.25. Then you end up with 1. Now we stop, because 1 is where I want to end up. Right? You always so want to end up at 1? No. You want to end up at whatever I ask you to end up at. In this question, I ask you to approximate y of 1. You know what happens when x is 0. I'm asking you what happens when x is 1. I split it up and I tell you how many subintervals I want, so you find that. You start at the zero, you keep adding delta x until I get to one. So it means that's the length of the table. Right? Here is where we want to get, right? I want to know when my x is one, what is my y? Right? Here's where I want to figure out. This is my y prime, which is actually just the y value in this case, right? So whatever answer I get here, I'm just going to copy it here because that's the formula. I'll give you a more slightly more complicated formula soon. Okay. That's sorry, the idea. How did you get the, the last term? Y term? What does that come Given. Okay. Right? Y prime is always given. Initial is given. Where you, what you want to approximate is given. The number of subintervals is given. So what goes here? One. One. Because I know when x is zero, y is one. So just one. In this case, what do I do here? Huh? It's still just one. My derivative is the y value. Whatever the y value is here, I'm just going to copy it here. That's the formula. Okay. Now here comes the fun part. Boom, move here. We have a new y value to approximate. How are we going to do it? Theorem 3.1. Take the old y value plus the old y prime value times delta x. What's the old y value? One plus the old y prime value, 1, times delta x, which is 0.25. So this gives us 1.25, which means my derivative at that point is 1.25, right? Because my derivative in this case is y. Whatever the y value is, that's my derivative. Do it again, right? Is it going to be 1.5? Well, we'll see. Old, y prime old, delta x. Right? What's my old y value? 1.25. I'm also talking about the previous one. 1.25 plus 1.25 times my delta x. 0.25. What's that? Make sure you guys are trying this in your calculator so you know. Um, will it, like, you see how it tells us that y prime is y? Yes. Um, will it, like, usually be a different equation? Like, will it say y equals y prime plus something? As I said, this is given. It is whatever you're given. Oh, so it could the formula, it could be something else. Okay, all right. This is just a very simple example, just so I don't scare anyone off. 1.56. 1.56. Uh, give me more decimal. 5625. Five, five, yeah. You can see that. 1.5625. Usually they'll ask you how many decimal places they want. Um, I would usually work one more than that. So let's say, give your answer in three decimal places. I'd always work with four decimal places and then round to three decimal places at the end. Okay. So right now, let's keep things at like four decimal places, roughly. okay? Now, if that's my guy, this is going to be 1.5625 again. Go down. What am I going to do? The old y value is 1.5625 plus the old y prime value is 1.5625 times delta x, 0.25. And what does that give us here? One point nine five three one. Does everyone agree? Okay. Which means my derivative is the same as my y value, so this is also one point nine five three one. Do it again. Old y value. One point nine five three one plus old y prime value one point nine five three one. 
times delta x, 0.25. What's that? 2.5 plus 0.25. What's that? 2.4413. And guess what? That's the approximation of my y value when my x value is 1. Therefore, I can conclude y of 1 is approximately 2.4413. Let me ask you a follow-up question. What are you approximating here? One. The value of y at x minus 1. Yeah, give me something specific. The value, the value of e. The value of e. How did you, rec how did you recognize that? Y prime equals y. We actually already know how to solve that. Y prime equals y, we know how to solve that. That gives us y equals c e to the x. If my y of 0 is 1, that means my c is 1. So y equals e to the x is the function I mean, that's actually going on here. When I say this means that y of 1 is just e to the 1, which is e. Now e is approximately 2.71828, yada, yada, yada. I was actually approximating this number. Now I got 2.4 when the answer is really 2.7. Not an extremely good approximation, not too bad. We we're off by like 0.3 or so, but that's just an idea. That's because I only use 4. If you could do this method a thousand times, you'd get a lot closer to 2.7, right? You can try this in Excel, right? You can actually program this formula into Excel and you can run it a thousand times. Your delta x is like, one over a thousand, and you'll actually get pretty close to that. Try ten thousand, try a hundred thousand, you'll get closer and closer and closer. We only use four steps, and we got we're just off by a point three. In this case, I can check our answer because that was an easy equation, we could solve that. So you actually know where you're heading, but sometimes you don't. Okay. Um, so that's the first example. Yes, so we are approximating the value of. In this case, yes. Now, does E have a value, or it can assume yes. like have... E is a constant. E is this. But depending on what we're giving, E can have different values, right? No, no E is a constant. So... E is a constant. Yeah, yeah E mean, E is this. Yeah. It's an irrational number. It's sort of like pi. Pi always means the same thing. 3.14159. It's always the same thing. E is, e is just a number. Don't mix up E with E to the X. Those are two different things. This takes on different values because it's a function. It's a function because of the X, not because of the E. E is a constant. It's 2.71828. Okay. Let's do a slightly more complicated one. One that you can still figure out the answer to. Which, by the way, that's kind of a typical problem, like in a final. They give you something where you can use um, Euler's equation on, but they'll give you something where you can actually find the answer another way, and they'll ask you to find it both ways and see how good your approximation is. So it's, that's a possible question. So my next example, it's still not super complicated, but it sort of mixes x's and y's, so let's see what goes on here. Yes. You make your own files, right? Are they as hard as the person? No. You're easy to remember. I don't even trust what he says. I don't trust what he says. I don't trust what he says. I don't trust what he says. No. When, when have I ever asked a hard question? I've never. What? Okay, I don't, what are you even talking about right now? I know you're kidding, but how much harder other than the quizzes is that final going to be? It's going to be super easy. 
Like your quizzes super easy? No, my quizzes are easy. Uh -huh. Like the final would be super easy. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, 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 it's just going to be hard. Are we the same class? Are you guys even paying attention? Use Euler's method with five <laughs> sub intervals. <laughs> to approximate the solution to y prime equals x over y. Given that y of 0 equals 2 at x equals 1. So the wording might be something like that. Okay, preliminaries. What's your name? What's A? What's B? What's delta X? A is zero. A is zero. A is always the initial X value. Right? So that's going to be my A. So A is 0. What's my B? No. Remember, A, B is the interval. They're both x values. Initial x value, final x value. 1. I want to approximate it there. How do I find my delta x? It's 0. Denote 1 minus 0 divided by 5. 5 subintervals. That's telling me the, oh, the n. So it's 1 minus 0 over 5. Yeah. 0.2. Okay. X equals 1. Initial x value. Final x value. And delta x is just final minus initial over n. Okay. So that's how we start. Now let's jump into this. So I have x, I have y, and I have y prime. This time my y prime is x over y. My initial values are my x is 0. When my x is 0, what's here? 2. When my x is 0, my y is 2. Which means what is going to be my derivative? 0. Because my 0 is x over y which is 0 over 2, which is just 0, right? These x and y values plug into the formula. Okay. Now the x's, you're going to keep adding delta x until you get to 1, right? So from 0, you're going to hit point 0.2, then you're going to hit point 0.4, then you're going to hit point 0.6, then you're going to hit point 0.8, finally you're going to end up at 1. Right? I keep adding the delta x until I get to the value I want to approximate. Start at 0, 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.2. Now the y values, I'm using the theorem 3.1. I'm always using the old y plus the old y prime times delta x. So what should I put here? 2, two plus? Plus 2 times 0.2. Plus zero. 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 The old y prime is 0 times 0.2, which is 2. Okay, now what is my y prime? 0.2 divided by 2, which is in this case 1. Right? So the two answers I get here, plug into that formula, gives me here. Right? Repeat. Old y value, 2 plus old y prime value, 0.1 times delta x, 0.2. What is that? 2.02? Okay, so what's my y prime? It's 24. It's going to be 0.4 divided by 2.02 2 
2.02. It's the x divided by the y. That's the formula. So that gives us 0 0.1. Uh, well, give me four decimal places. Uh, 1980. Everyone agree? Yeah. Make sure you're trying this in your calculator so you know if you, you're plugging things in correctly. Repeat. Okay. Just for a general idea, whenever we have decimals, what, how many decimal places do you want? Um, I'll usually ask you the question. Okay. So it'll tell you something like three decimal places or three. And in that case, I, in my computation, I'd always use like one more decimal place than is required and then round at the end. Okay, next step. Old y value. 2.02 2. 2. plus? 0.198. Times 0.2. Times 0.2, right? Old y value plus the old y prime times delta x. That gives me what here? 2.0596. Everyone get that? No. I got 2.0596, but I didn't get that. Some more answers. You got this one? Okay. Um, yeah, so what is my y prime? It's going to be 0. 0.6 over that, because that's almost my formula, x divided by y. 0. 0.6 over 2.0596. What do I get? 0. 0.213. 0. 0.2913. Everyone repeat. What do I write here? 0. 0.2913. What? 2.0596. Times 0.2. Times 0.2. What do I get? over here? 0.8 divided by 2.1179. Right, 0.8 divided by 2.1179, because the formula is x divided by y. So I take the x value divided by the y value. What do I get? 0.3777. So 0.3777. Do it again. What happens here? 2.1179 plus 0.3777 times 0.2. That gives me 2.1934. And that's the answer I want. I can stop there. I don't need to figure this out. I don't need the derivative here to figure out the next line, which I'm, I don't need. This means my y, when x is 1, is approximately 2.1934. That would be the answer. So whatever the answer to this differential equation is, which is not hard to find, this is actually separable as well. You can separate it and actually find the answer for yourself. Um, but approximately, when you plug in 1, it should be somewhere around 2.19. Probably not super close because we only took five steps. To me, this method really shine. You have to take like a thousand steps or something like that usually, which is what some of your Excel homework problems have you do. Okay. Well, what happened? Uh, what did you put in there? Two point one. Because I don't need this. Oh. Okay. At that point, I don't care, right? I need this derivative to find the next line, which I don't need. Right. So that's the idea. You start plugging in your initial condition. Plug in the x and y into whatever formula you're given. It goes here. The x is increasing by delta x until you get to the point you want to approximate. Your y values are given by theorem 3.1. Right? Old y value, old y prime value, which come from the previous row. So times delta x. And you just keep doing that. You keep rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat until you get here. What does the ODE actually tell us about this? 
It's telling me about the slope. The slope of some function behaves like this. And I'm asking you, when x is 1, what is the function? So that's like if you're in real life and you're watching something happen, right? And all you, the data you know, you can tell how fast it's happening. Oh, it's doubling this fast and all that's happening. You can write down a differential equation to describe it. But you can't solve the differential equation. But you want to predict what's going to happen in the future, you can use something like this. I know that, you know, six months down the road, this is roughly going to be the size, right? Even though I can't, I don't know the function. Because now it's just a matter of plugging. All of this knows that we didn't use any calculus, we didn't integrate, we didn't differentiate, we didn't do any of that stuff. It's algebra, right? It's all using an equation that we derived from calculus. Right? But it helps us to approximate our solution. So that's Euler's method in a nutshell. Um, by the time you get through the homework, you'll be able to do it in your eyes, I suppose. Um, so just for future reference, whenever we have a point, just after the first, uh, this quiz we just had, so it's this and whatever else we learn until next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you might have quiz on a material that the homework is not due yet. The quiz is just, is, everything you learned since the last quiz is what comes on each quiz. Okay. Uh, and that's every two twice a week or once? Like Could be week. once or twice. Expect at least once. Depend on my mood. Sometimes I'm in a good mood and I get two quizzes. Right? Yeah. You in a good mood? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's Euler's method. You have a lot more. Oh, I, I do ask you to find the exact solution. So let's actually do that. See how close this is. B. Find the exact solution and compare. It's very typical to ask something like that in a final. Okay, do all this method. Now tell me what the actual answer is so you can know how good it is to take however many steps you actually take. Um, yeah, so if I'm given y prime, well, which is equal to dy dx, which is x over y, and my y of 0 equals 2, how would I solve that? Separate it. What do I get if I separate it? You get 1 over y, dy. No. 1 dy equals yeah. oh, sorry, y, dy. y dy equals x dx. x dx. I'm going to integrate both sides. This gives you y squared over 2 equals x squared over 2 plus c. So you can multiply by 2, so I know that y squared is equal to x squared, x squared plus c. So my y is going to be plus or minus the radical of x squared plus c, right? Um, plus c is not good enough because I have an initial condition, so what am I going to do? Plug it in. What goes with here? 2. 2, right? Now notice this is a positive 2, which means I'm going to take the positive radical, right? I'm going to ignore the negative. Positive 2 is equal to? X is 0. So I'm going to put in 0 squared plus C. Which means that C equals 4. So that means my Y is equal to the square root of X squared plus 4. Now if I plug in Y of 1, that's actually just radical 5, right? What is actually radical 5 when you put it into your calculator? Uh, two point? 2.36. 2.36. 2.36. Yeah. Uh, yeah. right. So notice that if I rounded to one decimal place, we'd actually be spot on. Right? This was OK up to like one decimal place round. Yeah. What happened to the plus C? What happened to the C on the side? I brought it to that side and combined it in this C. Oh, so it would just be C whatever okay. yeah. C just represents a constant. Right? constant. I, I move all the constants to the right side because I'm solving for one. So let's say like somehow you're going to like multiply C by 2 or 4. So what would it just be C? 
Like it does the dimension curve. Yeah, so I mean, I could have had 2c here, in which case I'd have 2c here, which when I solve for c, I would get 2 instead of 4. So when I plug it back in, I'd get that 4 anyway. Uh, and you lost me. How did you get rid of the 2? Is that what he's asking? Yeah, he's saying, why isn't it 2c? Yeah, why isn't it? Like I was just explaining, it won't matter. So it's just a constant that I'm solving for. You can imagine if you were writing 2c this whole time, what you would have happened, you would have gotten a 2 here instead of a 4. Yeah, when you plug that 2 into one. here, you get 2 times 2. You That's get that 4 back. No. You, you're going to get the number no matter what. So manipulating the c, that's extra algebra that's just not going to benefit you at all, right? If you multiply the c by any constant, I just leave it as a c and keep going. It won't make a difference. You'll get the answer anyway. Because at the end, you have to solve for c. At the end, you have to solve for c by plugging in a value. It's going to give you the number that makes the equation work no matter what. So there's no need to, no, oh, it's, it's c over minus 5 times 2. You don't care. It's going to be whatever. Let's leave it as C. It makes no difference, but it makes it psychologically easier to solve. Yeah, that's the other method. Yes? Um, so if you were to ask us again, what are you approximating here? The value of E? No. You'd be approximating the value of radical x squared plus 4. If I were to ask, what function are you approximating here? You're approximating this function. The square root of x squared plus 4. Okay, so that's what I, was, I don't think I need to do it anymore. You'll get a lot of practice from the homework and it'll be, it'll be easy for you. Um, so, So because we're perfectionists and impatient, okay, all this math is good, but I want to get a better answer and I want to get it faster. I don't want to take four steps, I want to take two steps. <laughs> I need the answer now, like right now. Right? So basically what you do is okay, you put Euler's method on steroids, you end up with what's called modified Euler's method. Modifies Euler's method, your regular linear approximation formula is not good enough anymore. It's too slow. So this guy is going to use a more sophisticated equation. Basically what's going to happen, you're going to start off like you're doing an Euler's approximation, like a linear approximation formula, but in the middle of it, you're going to recalibrate and get another approximation that ends up better, right? So what happens is something like this. You got your function doing whatever it's doing, f of x. You know what it is at this point. x gives you f of x. Some point in the future, x plus delta x. You want to approximate f of x plus delta x. I have a function over there, right? So you start off like Euler's approximation, right? Boom, tangent line, boom, right, boom. Okay. Right. So now you're can so the distance between this and that is delta x. Right? Yeah. Tangent line approximation. This would be the approximation to the difference instead of that. Okay. But you're like, you know what? That's not good enough. So you kind of two-step the problem, right? But boom! Halfway there, x plus delta x over 2, reset up, set up all over again. 
Second tangent line. Boom! Look, I'm even closer, right? So I don't use one tangent line, I use two. Start off with one, halfway in, set up another one, right? Just fire while I'm already on mission, right? What happens is that second tangent line is going to get me closer to the y value than the first tangent line, right? So I'm still moving this distance, but I end up closer in any way, right? Because I'm using two tangent lines instead of one. If you make another tangent line halfway there. Come again? If you make another tangent line, like between some delta x over 4. Yeah, well, we're not that impatient, man. Jeez. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> we'll just do two. Right? <laughs> Some people are never <laughs> overachievers. Why do I have to only do two? No, we're doing two. We're stopping at two. <laughs> you're gonna like modify those met the Uber Oilers method, and you're, like <laughs> super premium Oilers. No, we'll stop at two. This is modified Oilers method. <laughs> two tangents. Okay, but that's basically the idea. Um, in summary, you basically get what's. The derivation of the equation at this point is going to be very similar to the last one, so I'm going to skip that. But in summary, you end up with theorem 3.2, which has all the usual preamble. Delta x is small, yada, yada, yada. Way there, right? Instead of, and then that actually gets you to the goal faster. Um, so this is the equation in theorem 3.2. So on a quiz, if I ask you, what's the equation in theorem 3.2? This is why I'm asking. Uh, one caveat. We need theorem 3.1 to use in theorem 3.2. Why? Like halfway there when I'm taking a, a, a new tangent line, right? Remember I don't know what the y value is doing. The y value I use at this point to launch my new tangent line is an approximation of the y value. It's not an actual y value. So what happened is that first approximation, I'm using Euler's method to make that first approximation. Right? But then, so theorem 3.1 is what I use here to set up my new tangent line. Right? So I actually need theorem 3.1 to be used in theorem 3.2, kind of a double approximation kind of thing. But at the end of the day, it works out. So this is theorem 3.2. Um, I was going to do an example. I don't, do, do you guys have any questions on Excel or that you want me to go over? Or? Yeah. 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 So, um, okay, we'll stop with new material there. We'll finish chapter three next week all right, on, on Monday. So all the homework for chapter two is due. So all the way up to homework four is due. Can we take out our Excel document? I don't know. Do you have any questions on the Excel thing?
There we go. Okay, so remember to use Google for everything. Basically where you go is, you'll need this for the rest of the homework. You go to like Google. Teach you guys how to Google. You go to the website, math, CCNY, or CCNY math, or whatever. You can go directly to the math department website, but you can also just go to courses. That's a shortcut. Then you would go to Math 209. Now, in the besides the first homework, all the other homeworks that refer you to Excel problems, you're going to need files in this guy here, 209files.zip. So you're going to download that, and when you open that, it'll have all these folders in it. So later on, when you're doing homework problems, it'll be referring to these files. It'll say, use the file od underscore sys to do blah, blah, blah. Right? And it has some codes um, done into it, done in it already. So I can show you an example of this. You don't need that for the first homework? Or? No. The, the homeworks will tell you which one of these files you'll be using. Except for the first one. Is it opening? Oh, there we go. So that's what it would look like. Right? So this is later. This is like, uh, I don't know, chapter 5? That's something like in chapter 5. We'll be doing this stuff. Right? So you, you'll be able to plug in your differential equation here and figure out the information. But in the homework, it's going to be referring to these files. That's where you'll find them. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about uh, okay, um, questions on the appendix. I guess. So what? What? Sometimes you're going to be required to do a list of things. So I'll probably show you a shortcut here. Like you might want to know. There's a shortcut to a list. You can. Excel is actually pretty good at picking up patterns. So let's say I want to number the columns, say, 1 through 20 or something like that, right? I go 1, 2, 3, and I'm going down, numbering the rows. I actually don't have to type out 20 of them. I can highlight it and say, hey, look up the pattern. By going to the bottom right here, you see you will turn that white plus sign will turn into a black plus sign. Grab it and drag it down. And it'll actually continue the pattern for me. Right? So there'll be Excels where it's going to tell you, like, Use 800 rows to do this. Don't sit there and type 1, 2, 3, 800. No, just 1, 2, 3, highlight them all, and just keep dragging until you get to 800. It actually won't take that long. In fact, I can even show you right now. Go, boom. 924, no sweat, right? So Excel can pick up patterns that way. What you could do as well is you can actually program functions. So let's say that's my x value, and my y value, I want to say, let's say I want to plot the function 2x, right? You can actually tell it a formula. Say, I want 2 times the number right beside it. Boom, you can, uh, sorry, you have to type equal first. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're entering a formula in Excel, you have to type equal and type in a formula you want to use, like 2 times, and you can actually select another cell, and it'll put it in, right? So the way it talks about cells is it tells you the column letter and the row number. So this is B2, right? the intersection of those two. So it says over here, I want you to put 2 times B2. Right? So when I do that and I press enter, it's going to just double that number. Right? Now I could do that, continually do that, like equals 2 times B3. It's 4. Okay, but again, remember what I said. Excel can follow patterns. It will pick up that the formula you want is to just double the cell to the left. So I can highlight those two and just... And I can just keep going. And it'll automatically know to double all the guys to the left. At any given point when I plug in a cell, you'll see it say 2 times B917. Right? It'll automatically hey, I figure out what you're trying to do, right? So you just enter a formula a couple of times, highlight it, and you can drag it, and you'll copy that formula, right? Um, another thing you'll be doing a lot is uh, graphing, I guess. And the formulas can get um, 
pretty uh, advanced, right? So later we'll be doing statistics. You can find correlation coefficients, find standard deviations, all that. There are built-in forms for that in Excel. Right? This is just a very simple example. Um, so if you're graphing, what you can do is you can highlight all these guys. And then usually, you, um, the thing is, sometimes the, form, the versions of Excel might be different. Personally, I have 2013, but this is 2010. So things might be different. You might have to search a little bit. But here you can see all these charts that we can actually do. So I can do something like a line chart. And I can, it will actually plot the graph of X and Y. Right? And, and in here, usually it's a, like a, if you go here, you like right click. You can do format chart. You can put in border colors. You can put in titles. You can put in a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I probably won't go through the, I don't know what version everyone has. But you, literally, I, like I said, you can use Google for any, everything. So if you have to do something in your Excel homework that you're not sure how to do, you literally go to Google and say, um, how to put in chart title Excel content. Right? <laughs> List of instructions. Right? So anything you need to do, you'll be able to do using the files that you're referred to in the homework. Um, so if there are any specific questions about what was done in the, um, the appendix homework. Um, for now, those are just some of the skills that I think make things a lot easier. But of course, there are many other tips that you'll pick up along the way. Unless there are any specific questions from the appendix that we'll want to so go over. Yeah. Um, question six says, how much do you fill in the series dialog box below? I would be to do what? Depends on what you're doing. You wish to generate the linear series 25832 so A2. And it's like how much you fill in the series dialog box below. How would you put that in? Yeah, series dialog box, I wouldn't use that. Do what I did here. Right? So once you fill in those formulas, you can actually drag it. And it's like what formula should you enter to do what? Um, yeah, you wish to construct uh, is it right? Right? Yeah, various rectangles. So for example here So this is just giving you an example of how you'd want to compute have Excel do computations for. By the way, I, I could even show you guys how to set up like a modified Euler's table, an Euler equation, an Euler's method into this thing and you see how it works. Anyway, um, let's do that later. But yeah, there's something that says length, width, area, perimeter. Right? So this talk about length and width of various rectangles, right? So you can choose one. Let's say I want the length to be 2 and the width to be 1 or the length to be 4 and the width to be 7, or the length to be 2 and the width to be 0.5, right? Now, when you want to figure out something like area, you, you'd have to know the formula ahead of time. How do you find the area of a rectangle? Length, length times width. width. So you'd enter equal length. Multiplication is asterisk, so that's times width. Enter. So that will give me the area. And I copy, I drag this to copy that formula down. And it will always take length times width of those two. What's the perimeter? Wait, what's the two times the length plus two times the width. That would be the perimeter of such a rectangle. And then I can copy that formula down to fill out the table. Of course, they, you, can have, you can have a long table and you can just Excel will do everything for you. That first um, Euler's equation, right? When we had x, y, y prime. So if you're doing this at home and you don't know if you're doing it right or you're getting the right answers, you can actually go to Excel and check your answer. So let's say we did that first question where our initial x was 0, our initial y was 1, our initial y, well, what do we have for y prime? It was just equal to whatever the y value. So I'll say equal that cell. Done, right? Here I can always say this is equal to the guy above 
plus 0.25, right? So I can copy that down. Wait, uh, copy that down. Keep going. Okay, so it filled out the excess for me. What do I put here? Equals the old y value plus the old y prime value times the delta x, which is always 0.25. Here, it's going to be equal to whatever that y value is, because that was the formula. I'm going to take this, keep going, this, keep going. Remember our answer, 2.4414, right? So you can actually check it every step of the way if you're not getting the answers. Go to Excel and see it. And guess what? I don't like how far away from the solution we are. So what if I wanted my delta x? Let's say I wanted delta x equals, let's set something really nice, like point zero zero one. Okay. So then here, I will say this is, so I'm going to show you a trick here. This is equal to the previous x plus, if you want Excel to fixate on a cell and not change it, right? Like my delta x is always going to be in this position, I5, right? I want it to always look there for delta x and not change when the formula is changing. What you do is you use dollar signs. You put a dollar sign in front of anything you want to fix. So for example, I can say dollar i, that fixes column i, dollar five. So it's always going to look at that cell, no matter where in this table I am, right? And I'm going to do that, and I'm going to keep going until I hit uh, 1, which is going to be a while. <laughs> we passed 1, but let's, let's go up to 1. Let's see how close we get to E now. <laughs> We're doing like a thousand. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's see how close we actually get. And again, here. So I have this is equal to the old y plus the old y prime times delta x. I am going to Oh, I forgot to change the delta x. Yeah, let's uh, because it's still using 0.25. Okay, so here again, I'm going to take this times. No, assign it. So dollar sign i, dollar sign phi, and this one is that's fine. Right, so now let's drag that. Two point seven one six nine. Right? Remember the actual answer is two point seven one eight two eight. So this is kind of show you the more pieces you cut it up in, the actual close to the answer would be. And that was like nothing. That took like no time to do this a thousand times, right? So that's why Excel is a really powerful one. You can use it to check your answers. Those are just some of the tips you need. So all the chapter two homeworks are due next week. Appendix for Excel is also due, and I think in chapter 2 there are also Excel problems, so you can try your hand at those. Let's see you guys next week.